welcome here we are all at home safe I hope I hope the families are safe every member of the house knows not to go out and uh, be uh, congregating with very many folks as uh, uh, being microbiologists I'm sure you can appreciate that uh, we have a couple things to go over uh, just to uh, get us uh, situated for uh, the rest of the semester. I just want to uh, assure you that uh, I'm here uh, to, to help you through this. We, we will get through it. You're going to do well. Hopefully we can have fun along the way. It will be different. Uh, we won't have the luxury of being together, which I miss, but uh, it's something that we're going to have to do. So uh, we just face it, move on, and um, so anyhow, let's do that. Let's do that here. Uh, so the, the to-do list for uh, us at this first time that we get together in this modality is uh, our to-do list really is going to be a simple one. I want us to get it started. I have a few things to go over. You can follow those. Uh, I assure you, you can always email me and I have some contact information. Uh, you can even call my cell phone if you need to. Uh, but we also have Zoom and a few other things that I'll talk about uh, for, uh, for our office hours if you need that. So the to-do to list for Chapter 6 is uh, go through this presentation I'm working on uh, with you together right now. And what we have is a, a worksheet. If you could fill that out uh, using uh, Word and uh, just email that to me. And uh, make sure that you get uh, I received it uh, response so that you know that I got it and uh, I like to do that until I get all the snags worked out there may be other ways to uh, submit the work but for right now uh, this will work for for our purposes now you always have a week from the first day uh, all week so you can view this video at your leisure uh, during the week uh, I have to break this one up in uh, into two pieces uh, just because of YouTube's, YouTube's limitation, but uh, and the other is that uh, it is two classes. I am su supplementing the, the time that we're normally together for 50 minutes, and so I, I try to cover all of the timing so uh, you get your money's worth and uh, still cover the materials that we need. And uh, uh, this will be modified as time goes on or tweaked uh, to uh, everyone's satisfaction, I hope and uh, at least that's my goal. Uh, in lessons, all the chapter six materials can be found, so you just click on that. There's nothing really new, and just migrate to the chapter six, and you can see the list of various things. Uh, one of the things that's not listed, of course, is this presentation, because I'm working on it uh, as we speak. So uh, that will be there uh, for you. I will also include a uh, video for lab today. I'm working on that. Uh, we really only have uh, two labs to cover. Uh, the staff lab, which I took pictures of all your plates, and they could be found in the Staphylococcus lab. So uh, your teams uh, get together, I guess, uh, just by uh, finding your table number and uh, your data. and. Uh, it's one of the uses for Teams is to find Teams that is Microsoft Teams and students will have access. You can work together on Teams uh, as uh, a lab, a bench, group, and uh, complete the assignments uh, the best you can. Now, I understand Teams is new and the whole uh, format's new. So, of course, um, I, I limited uh, the work pretty straightforward uh, with the lab manual and to do the staff and strep and the plates and everything are available. All I'm asking for you to do on the strep plates is that these are your other section plates and just find a representative for each of the numbers, one through four, and see if you can identify each of the unknowns as one through four and uh, with the information that I provided. That's it for the lab, but I want you to get used to working together on teams and uh, then submit uh, the lab report uh, where the labs uh, 
which I will provide in Word format so you can edit those easy. I'm working on that right now. So at least you can uh, read through the materials and, and, and see what's done. By the end of the day, I'll have all the things reduced to Word format for you. So uh, that's pretty much that. Um, how to access Teams is listed in uh, Lessons. Just go in How to Access Teams. I have three videos in there. The first one is How to Access Teams for Students, and that was written uh, by Wake Tech. Uh, administration so you can look at that and then I have two generic ones on how to use it and uh, to take advantage of some of the really nice features they turned on teams for you with all the access and bells and whistles so it's free of course and they've included it and how to access it is is right there in the first video so you can learn to do that and apply that for your labs and uh, breaking up into your teams and uh, for your bench uh, as you have normally. Let's see how that works out and I'll, I'll monitor it. I will be around uh, various times on Teams if there's, if there's questions about that uh, or you can just drop me an email and as I say my expectations right now let's, let's get uh, so that we get familiar with some of the tools and uh, and we'll get through this. Uh, the tools are I'm trying not to be over overly too much technical I want the easiest to use, and that's why I selected that. Um, the Zoom, I'm going to reserve to use that uh, initially, at least for uh, my office hours. You can see a face-to-face. -face, you can come up as a group. Uh, seeing how the network, uh, what I'm worried about is my bandwidth at my home. Uh, I also have a wife who does Wake County Public Schools, and she is constantly on the network. I call her the network pig. but. Uh, so right now, I, I want to limit the Zoom for uh, our regular just uh, office hours, but I may open it up for uh, just a regular class meeting, perhaps, uh, if students want that. Uh, it won't be mandatory, of course. It would be just uh, if you want. Now, I'm also looking at creating uh, the discussions uh, by a new program, or it's an open source program, uh, I'm do using Camtasia right now, but I'm thinking about another one that streams and also uh, produces a video. And if I give you the time at which the stream starts, you can watch that and interact with it uh, if you'd like. Uh, that I'm working on. Uh, I think that would be a good feature, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I've got it working. There's a lot of benefits to it, but for right now, we'll just see how it goes. And we'll go from there. Uh, so that's that. So if you have any questions, you can always email me, just like always. And then I gave you a phone number. Uh, that's my cell phone number. And uh, feel free to call if you uh, absolutely last resort have to get a hold of me. Uh, don't put it on bathroom walls. Don't uh, take it around or any place like that. This is uh, just between you and I. And uh, we'll go from there. So, chapter six, microbial nutrition and growth. This is a pretty straightforward chapter. It's not exciting, I have to warn you. It's uh, one of the necessaries. We have to understand uh, about microbial nutrition and growth uh, before we can really kind of get into uh, the real understanding of how we manipulate and control these organisms. So we're gonna look at uh, the nutrients that are essential we're going to differentiate between the, the terms, again, this vocabulary, macronutrients and micronutrients. List and define the four different terms that describe uh, organism sources of carbon. Uh, microbiology lingo, uh, carbon source is the sugars usually that we uh, add to the media. So what's the carbon source? Well, they use the carbon source for energy. We're going to talk about sap probes and parasites. And again, uh, these are terminology type things. We're going to talk about stuff you should already know about, but I'll go over it again. Diffusion and osmosis. we go out, uh, we talk about uh, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic type solutions and how that affects the cells. And of course that addresses the salt uh, concentration uh, or the exposure to salt in the environment and how microorganisms try to deal with that. Uh, Two types of passive and uh, active type of transports. Again, this should be stuff that you're already familiar with. So this is a pretty straightforward chapter. 
it's a good one to get started into this new uh, sort of uh, format that we're working on and you uh, try to keep everything consistent the way uh, this is uh, kind of rolling out and I would love to get your feedback let me know uh, if this works for you uh, ultimately it's uh, for for you so, uh, so the microbial nutrition essential nutrients any substance that must be provided to an organism to grow it I mean these are the things they have to have in order to do the business and some of it they can manufacture on their own but uh, there are things that they absolutely have to have macronutrients are required in relatively large quantities uh, like water and that sort of thing and plays uh, principal roles in cell structure and metabolism so these include carbon hydrogen and oxygen the micronutrients are smaller amounts can be also uh, looked at as trace these could be manganese zinc iron uh, nickel various smaller functions but absolutely required if you don't include that they're not going to grow inorganic nutrients are simple uh, mo molecules that contain a combination of atoms other than carbon and hydrogen so that, those are your inorganic found on the earth's crust bodies of water various things usually we're talking about metals and, and their salts magnesium sulfate uh, ferric nitrate these these are salts of these sorts of compounds sodium phosphate or gases like oxygen carbon dioxide those sorts of things that easily uh, go through membranes organic nutrients contain carbon hydrogen atoms that are usually the products of living things simple organic molecules such as methane or if you're from the UK methane uh, large polymers carbohydrates lipids uh, proteins nucleic acids that's the sort of thing that we uh, you should already know about the large polymers of course water is an essential component 70% of all components the proteins Organic compounds make up about 97% of the dry weight. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, phosphate, and sulfur is uh, CHOMPS is the elements, is a uh, acronym to remember that. Most chemical elements are available to the cell as compounds and not as pure elements. The, the salts, the uh, sodium versions of various things and that sort of thing. Uh, only a few types of nutrients needed to synthesize over 50. 5,000 different compounds, which is amazing. These are lean, mean fighting machines, and they know how to do it. Okay, some more vocabulary. This is talking about what bacteria eat. These are heterotrophs, organic. Uh, it's an orga organism that must contain uh, its carbon in an organic form. So heterotroph has to go out, and so it's different. Uh, troph means it has a predilection or a needing for. Uh, hetero is different, so it's different from itself or outside of itself. Autotrophs, an organism that uses inorganic uh, CO2 as its carbon source, and they usually refer to that as carbon fixation or CO2 fixation, and they can actually pull it right out of the air. It has a capacity to convert CO2 into organic compounds. This is a really important thing. Now, we already are aware of those sorts of things, as in uh, photosynthesis. Uh, plants can pull CO2 right out of the air, incorporate that carbon into the plant, and bacteria uh, can do the same. Um, not nutritionally dependent on other living things, which an autotroph, that's a really nice feature uh, to have. A phototroph is a microbe that actually photosynthesis or fantasizes. Uh, photosynthesis is a really cool process, and um, photosynthesis is uh, something that bacteria do. Uh, chemotrophs are microbes that get its energy from chemical compounds. Okay, so there's some charts that summarize uh, all of these things. And you can see autotrophs, uh, just uh, with more detail, we have the chemo autotroph or chemo organic autotrophs. They use organic materials. And uh, we have chemo autotrophs or inorganic compounds. Chemolitho autotrophs are minerals. If you think of lith as like a stone or a rock, um, so uh, that kind of indicate minerals if you want to use that to remember. Uh, they re refer to these organisms as rock eating, so they're the lithotroph and rock uh, kind of works. Uh, these are pretty tough organisms. Some of these organisms that are in this group uh, 
they can survive on uh, uh, amazing things that we normally would say were toxic to us. Photoheterotrophs, the sunlight, of course, uh, purple and green photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, chemoheterotrophs, uh, these uh, convert metabolically nutrients from other organisms. Uh, protozoa, fungi, many bacteria and animals, of, of course. Chemoheterotrophs metabolize or, uh, organic matter of dead organisms. And uh, the fungi and bacteria kind of fall in that group. Chemoheterotrophs, or the parasites, utilize the tissues, fluids of living, various parasites, pathogens, bacteria, fungi, protozoa. Now, in some cases, they still use leeches to... Uh, they only eat dead material, so it's one, one way of clearing up or cleaning uh, tissues that are uh, rather dirty and dead, uh, maybe from a disease or something like that. Now, it sounds a little um, rough, but that, uh, it's still used today. Uh, so the photoautotrophs uh, are those that use photosynthesis. Autotroph, that they don't need anyone else. They can get all of their energy needs from photosynthesis. And they produce organic molecules uh, using the CO2 that they can now pull from the air in the process of photosynthesis. Chemoautotrophs use organic compounds for energy, and they get that from their environment. The lithoautotrophs rely totally on inorganic materials, uh, require neither sunlight or organic nutrients. And these, again, they dwell at the bottom of oceans and really rough places. Chemoheterotrophs derive carbon and energy from organic compounds, uh, process these molecules through cellular respiration or fermentation. Saprobes are free living that feed on organic uh, just matter or detritus from dead organisms. Decomposers of plant litter, dead microbes and various things, and they recycle. These are the great recyclers and we'd be up to our keister in dead things if we didn't have these. Parasites derive nutrients from the cell tissues of a living host. Pathogens cause damage, which this is really kind of what we're talking about in this course uh, as far as business goes. Uh, they cause damage um, to tissues or even death. Range from viruses to helmets. Uh, the uh, ectoparasites live on the body. Endoparasites live in the organs and tissues, which uh, would be really nasty. Intracellular parasites live within cells. Now, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, and there are some other organisms, uh, even E. coli at times can be intracellular parasites, but Borrelia burgdorferi that causes Lyme disease is an obligate intracellular parasite uh, as, as, uh, as others. So obligate parasites unable to grow outside of the living, uh, leprosy bacillus and the syphilis spirochetes are additional ones to my list. Uh, listed here. So it, there are several examples, many examples, in fact, uh, that are obligate intercellular parasites. Centronutrients, carbon, I don't need to really go over that much. Uh, these you should be familiar with. Hydrogen, uh, usually to satisfy the octet rule uh, to make the compounds uh, more stable with all the binding sites that they have for the octet rule you recall from the chemistry. So uh, you look at the oxygen, it needs two more uh, to satisfy uh, all of the available uh, electron seats and hydrogens can do that by sharing it. So H2O, various things like that. These gases are both used and produced by microbes. Uh, hydrogen helps uh, maintain their pH. So again, there's duality in a lot of these things. Uh, the way they use these uh, to maintain the pH or ways to uh, live in their environment. Oxygen, major component such as carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, nothing new there. Oxygen is likewise a common component or inorganic salts. Uh, that forms the salt. That is why we call it a salt is that it contains an oxygen type molecule. Uh, phosphates, nitrates, and water. Uh, free gaseous oxygen makes up 20% of the atmosphere, which was provided, by the way, by the bacteria friends uh, that are in our environment. And so, anyhow, 20% of uh, our atmosphere is from them. So, not bad. 
nitrogen, major reservoir of nitrogen, it's nitrogen gas, which makes up 79% of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, it's indisposable with our favorite friends of proteins, DNA, RNA, ATP, those sorts of things. Some bacteria and algae utilize inorganic nitrogenous uh, nutrients like NO3, NO2, NH3. Uh, a small number of bacteria and archaea can transform nitrogen into other compounds. And uh, so, uh, regardless of the initial form in which inorganic nitrogens uh, enter the cell, it must be converted to NH3. So, uh, the only form it can be directly combined with carbon to synthesize amino acids and other compounds. Okay, so they're pretty straightforward. Uh, I have a summary in the uh, chapter six directory that uh, helps summarize all of these items that I'm going over, but they are straightforward. Uh, th this is what I consider the, it's a great chapter to get us going uh, into this new mod modality that we're in. Uh, it's straightforward. It, it, it is reviewed from some things that you already know, but uh, it serves as a good way to, to get us back into uh, the game. So uh, phosphate and sulfur. Phosphate is an uh, inorganic source of phosphorus. Uh, PO4 is derived from phosphoric acid. It's found in rocks and various things. Pretty, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, it's also used in ATP. Now, ATP, as you know, is the energy molecule. It's all about the phosphates and the double bonds and the energy that's in those chemical bonds. Um, that drive all of life, and so that's that's something. You know, bacteria. We, we talked about uh, ATP synthase and the, the turning of the motor to make ATP. It's amazing, all coming from the basic element of phosphate, and so we use that uh, for lots of things. Other important important nutrients are potassium, sodium. Now we know a lot of these in muscle function, but these are for sodium pumps, driving energy types of needs. Uh, also, it's important for certain functions of bacteria. Now, we, we talk about the pathogenic ones and ones that cause disease, and sometimes uh, they steal our sodium and magnesium or calcium or iron, and uh, they have to outcompete our systems for that in order to cause disease. So it's important to at least m mention that. Now, zinc is another one that's essential for regulatory elements. These uh, elements have to be uh, associated with proteins. The protein by itself or the amino acids are incapable of pulling off whatever the function it is that's needed. So these are sort of the building blocks to make uh, complement protein function. As we know, a good example, heme. Heme uses iron. The heme holds the iron molecule, so they work hand in hand together, and that's the same sort of thing here. Also, uh, it sets up uh, situations where uh, we can get electrical currents and things like that. The mi microorganisms that we're not worried about as far as disease uh, actually can be charged like batteries. They actually have, uh, they can detect north and south uh, magnetic uh, various things using components like this. Okay, how microbes eat and transport mechanisms. Now we're going to cover this diffusion and then I'm going to stop and break it uh, presentation uh, into a section uh, or part two. Uh, that way I don't get in trouble by uh, YouTube. And also it gives you a chance to break and, and read through, uh, replay set certain sections if you need to. Um, again, I'd love your feedback on the quality and, and the various things. Uh, and I'm trying uh, different ways to do this. Uh, online is not my favorite mode of doing things, but uh, hey, we do what we have to do. So transport of necessary nutrients occurs across membranes. Usually this is what we're talking about. They have to get things into the cell. Not everything, things that they need. And uh, we do this through a permissive nature of cell walls and embedding proteins and various things that facilitate the movements across of various things. But one uh, that we're going to talk about doesn't require any specialized hardware. It's taking advantage of just having that phospholipid bilayer membrane and we have things that diffuse uh, which is a phenomenon of molecular movement in which atoms or molecules move in a gradient from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. 
and you can substitute the word density in there if you want, but the concentration seems to make more sense to me. Now, uh, osmosis is the diffusion of water through a selective uh, or differentially permeable. In other words, it's not permeable to everything. Some things don't move in, some don't. This is osmotic pressure. And so if we have uh, a lot of things that uh, take up space, or devoid of water in one area, uh, we have to have somewhat of an equal uh, osmotic pressure. We're going to talk about that through a process of osmosis. Uh, organisms that can't handle or maintain that osmotic pressure, they won't survive. They'll either shrivel up or they'll get so much water that they'll burst. It's the same thing that happens with our red blood cells. Uh, we have to have 0.95% salt in our blood if that differs in one way or let's say you just were to inject someone with pure water that would be deleterious because uh, the red blood cells of course maintain a certain concentration of water and you have pure water on the outside then you're going to get a net movement uh, trying to make the two equal uh, so some of the salts will leave or the, the materials in the uh, bacteria will leave and it'll shrivel up and we'll talk more about that so uh, this will continue until the concentrations are equalized on both sides, and that's the key to osmosis. The osmotic pressure, by the way, is driven by gravity. And so here is a uh, container looking through a selectable membrane, membrane sac. You have solute and water. Solute takes up space or displaces water. And so when you have a pore size, which are permeable to the water but not to the um, solute and you can see that uh, what's going to happen is they're going to try to equalize the amount of water uh, across the sides of, of the two and when we do that it's through the process of osmosis and um, I will stop here I want you to uh, review the isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic this is where we'll start next time uh, for the rest of this week so this this one chapter is for this week and chapter six, and if you can watch the video and do the worksheet, um, next week we'll move on to uh, the next chapter nine and uh, get into that. We only have four four weeks, I think, until we're, we're done with things. So uh, I figure this is a good balance, a good chance to boost your grade and uh, learn some stuff. And if you have questions about anything, uh, just send an email or you can bring it up in a uh, office uh, uh, time that I have with Zoom. So I hope this helps and uh, it's, I, I can't see you, but it's nice being able to uh, communicate with you. And again, I hope everyone is well and is doing what they need to do. So uh, until uh, the next video, uh, uh, be safe.